Hello my lovely friends, welcome back to another video. In this video we're going to be doing part 5 of questions about mediumship. So I received so many questions from you guys via my YouTube channel, my Facebook, or my Instagram asking me questions about mediumship or things you'd like me to do videos on. So in this video, we're going to do part five of questions for mediumship. As always, I'm going to put the questions in the description down below and I will timestamp them so you don't have to watch the whole video if you're only looking for one specific question to be answered. Thank you all so much for being here. Let's get to it. The first question I have here is, was it a challenge for you to come out and tell your friends and family about your gift? Yes and no. For me, I was very lucky in some ways and in other ways it really showed me who really supported me and cared about me. So I guess I was lucky in that manner as well. So when I first discovered that I could do the mediumship work, the psychic work, the things that I do now, I was 36 years old. I'm almost 40 now and you know for 36 years everybody knew me as one way they knew me as Mel this is Mel this is Mel and I wasn't psychic I never did mediumship work I was never into tarot I couldn't do any of that stuff and then I can understand their point of view because one day I'm coming out with a post saying I'm doing mediumship work can I practice on you and, you know, I can understand where people are like, okay, wait a minute, this is a total 180. However, a lot of them never even responded to me, never take part in anything that I communicate out. But there were a handful that were so supportive, so caring, and wanted to help me learn and grow. And that is what meant so much to me. Now, if you're asking if I lost some friends and family along the way, the answer is yes. But for me, I am grateful for that because it showed me who really supports me and who really wants to be by my side. And the ones that are supporting me and there for me are the ones that have meant the most to me out of all of my friends and family. And I still, the ones that don't support me, I still wish them well. I still talk to them. I still communicate with them. They're just not as huge a part of my daily life as they used to be. I'm on a completely different path than them. That doesn't mean they're wrong or I'm better. That doesn't mean that at all. It just means that we do not align in our lives anymore and that's completely okay. If also part of your question is how do you do that and if you're afraid like what do you do, uh, my best and biggest advice to you is to just jump out and do it. I held on to it for about six, seven months, maybe even a little longer than that because I was so afraid to say it. I was so afraid to post it. I was so afraid to admit it because of the stigma around it, because of the people that don't agree. And I was so afraid of the judgments that I took forever to put myself out there. And I regret that very much because I lost a lot of time where I could have been doing what I love more than anything. So if there's a piece of advice I could give you about this, it would be to just do it. Just put yourself out there. Make that Instagram account. Make that Facebook account. Make that YouTube account. Get yourself going. Get yourself out there. And you're going to be so thankful that you did. Once I started saying, I'm a medium, I'm a psychic, I can do these things, a lot of doors opened for me. I felt freer in my body. I felt freer in my soul. And it felt like I could actually breathe again. Like I was actually living my purpose by speaking what was in my heart. So if any advice you could take from me from this whole video is just jump in, go for it and follow your heart. My next question here is, what is the best way to attract sitters? Okay, so I, this is a beautiful question. There's many different ways that you can use to have sitters for practice. Now, for those of you that don't know, a sitter is somebody who you are practicing your psychic work on, somebody that you are practicing your Reiki on, or your mediumship work on. They're just sitting there to allow you space to practice and they're giving you feedback. So in order to attract sitters, there's lots of different ways. First of all, one of the ways that I used was putting it out to the universe, putting it out to God and my spirit guide saying, hey, I'm ready for this. I finally put my voice out there. I finally said I'm a medium, I'm a psychic, I want to work and I want to do this. 
And I said, bring clients to me, bring sitters to me, bring practice to me. And that really did help me. I was getting random messages on Instagram. You know, our thoughts really do control a lot of our reality. And our thoughts really do bring those things to us that we're thinking about. So when you're going to God and you're saying, I'm ready for this, the universe will start to align to bring those things to your life, to bring those things to you. So the first thing I suggest when you're ready to attract sitters and or clients, if you're at that stage, is to put that out to God, to the universe and say, I'm ready. And things will start to align. Something else you can do is join Facebook or even Instagram groups where you're allowed to post in there and say, I'm practicing this, I'm practicing mediumship, or I am practicing psychic work, and I would like a sitter to practice with. You will find so many people that are wanting to help you, that are wanting to volunteer, that want to align with you and work with you and allow you the space to practice. I also have my own private Facebook group, Soul Care Intuitive, where you can post in there to get practice sitters, practice readings. I have my mediumship students in this group as well. So even if you're not on a mediumship journey, maybe you're on a psychic journey, a tarot journey, a Reiki journey, and you just want to practice and have a safe space to do that, you can join my private Facebook group, Soul Care Intuitive, and you can post in there for sitters. And there's so many people that are so loving in that group that will help you and practice with you. I do suggest that you ask friends of friends if you want to practice in a close-knit environment. Not necessarily family or, or really close friends, only because you already know so much about them and you already know so much about their past loved ones potentially that it's going to get confusing for you whether your mind is showing you this or spirit is showing you this. So it's best to practice with friends of friends or friends outside of a circle that you know so that you don't necessarily know so much about them or their past loved ones. But attracting sitters is really simple through the groups, through the intention to the universe, and just through putting that out there from your heart, you will attract the right sitters and the right clients to you. Using manifestation techniques has also helped me. Writing in a journal, I am attracting sitters for you or clients if you're at that point. I am attracting clients every day. I am attracting loving, caring, and compassionate clients to my business every day. Using manifestation techniques will help you with the attraction as well. This next question is one that I receive so often and it's one that I personally have gone through as well. The question is, why do I hear from spirit when I'm not doing anything? And when I try to get a hold of them, I can't hear anything. So this person is asking me when they're in a setting where they're trying to connect, they're trying to get someone from spirit that they're not getting anything. But when they're doing nothing like washing the dishes or driving their car or watching TV, all of a sudden they can get communication. This happened to me so much in the beginning too. And it used to drive me crazy. It's because when you're doing the dishes, when you're watching television or you're driving or whatever you're doing where you're not thinking, it's because your brain and your ego, your mind has turned off and it gives more space and more room for spirit to step in and communicate with you. When you're in a setting where you're sitting there and you're just trying and you're focusing and you really want to connect, it's like there's a disconnect from you and spirit because your mind is thinking, okay, I have to connect. I have to get this. Is there a connection? Is there a spirit here? Your mind is just going crazy. And uh, as well, if you're in front of a sitter or a client, the, the nerves are taking place as well. So when you're not doing anything, it's so much easier for spirit to come in and communicate because your body's already relaxed, you're calm, you're not thinking, you're not worrying, you're not nervous, you're not stressed. And so it's much easier for spirit to come in and blend with you in those moments. What I suggest you can do to help with this is to meditate more, to learn how to quiet your mind and learn how to calm your body. I do also suggest sitting in the power, which is a technique of sitting with spirit to gain that power, to build that power, to sit with spirit and to feel them so that you know when they're coming in, when they're communicating more. So meditation and sitting in the power are really going to help you learn how to 
establish that connection better when you're sitting down on purpose to connect to spirit. Um, I love when spirit connects to me, even when I'm doing the dishes or I'm driving. So I don't set that boundary. But if you don't want them to communicate with you when you're not specifically sitting down for a reading, you can set that boundary as well by saying, you know, spirit, I do not want to be communicated with unless I'm sitting down with the intention of connecting for a reading. And spirit really does listen to and adhere to our boundaries. I can't say it's 100% of the time. Sometimes you'll get something that oversteps a boundary and you just have to say, hey, you know, this is my boundary. I'm not going to do this and just move on. So if you want to focus more on only having spirit communicate with you when you are purposely trying to read for someone, set that boundary that says, do not connect with me otherwise. And you can set that in any words, in any way that you like, either just speaking it in your mind, speaking it out loud, writing it in a journal. Um, when you are sitting down intentionally for a reading, you want to do your best to just be relaxed, be calm. Of course, you're going to be nervous. I have been doing professional readings for years and I'm still nervous because I want to give my client the best experience. In my opinion, being nervous is a good sign because it means that you want to do well and you want to do good for your client. Okay, you're not coming at it from your ego. You're coming at it from love and you're nervous because you want to provide that love in the reading. But if you can find a way through meditation, through sitting in the power, maybe some of you prefer to go for a walk beforehand to just really loosen your body and loosen your mind, going for a walk would really, really work. But when you're intentionally trying to connect and nothing is happening, it's because you are in your own way. Spirit is always there, always around, omnipresent and always willing and able and wanting to communicate with us and help those of us who are still on earth with many different things. So when you're unable to connect, it's, it's an issue on you and you just need to find a way to move your ego and your mind aside to allow spirit to just come in and flow with you. Again, that could be through meditation, sitting in the power, going for a walk, whatever gets you to move to the side and kind of calm down before a reading is perfect. I do want to say though, you don't need any of those things to have a good reading. You can and you will get yourself to a point where when you sit, it's game time, it's go time, and you don't have to worry about that anymore. So when you're in the beginning stages and you have to keep meditating and you have to keep sitting in the power beforehand and you're like, okay, I, I need 10 minutes to, to do this before my reading, just know that over time, your mind is gonna get used to stepping to the side. Your ego is gonna get used to stepping to the side and your body, your soul is gonna get used to spirit blending with you to the point where you're not gonna have to constantly do those I call them rituals or routines before a reading. My next question here is how do you set aside your ego and not get so emotional in a reading? So I don't necessarily agree that you cannot get emotional in a reading. I have been with a client and I've cried before when a spirit has communicated something because I'm human. I am in a human body. I am not a robot who cannot show or who can hide emotion. And I never had a problem with a client seeing me cry as well. In fact, I think it brought me and the client closer because they realized I'm human just like they are. I'm a person and a soul just like they are. I have emotions and I have desires and wishes and things running through my body the same as theirs. And when I connect with, let's say, a father for my client, it's emotional for me because I've lost my father. So I understand where my client's coming from. And I have cried in readings where I've connected to a father expressing deep love and caring for their child that's in front of me. And my clients have never ever once said to me, why are you crying? This is ruining the reading. You shouldn't do that. I feel like when you're showing your emotion, now I'm not saying you should be crying in every reading, but when it authentically comes out, I feel that that's an amazing thing. I feel that's a connection between you your client and spirit, the three of you are forming a connection when you are authentically showing emotion. I don't feel that this is a bad thing. 
I have seen other mediums that say that showing emotion during a reading is unprofessional. And I, you know, that is their opinion. I have never once said, don't do this or don't do that. I personally believe that it's up to you. This is your calling and your business and your reading, okay? If you are crying in a reading authentically because something coming through is emotionally charging you, I don't see any harm in that. Where the harm might come is where you just keep crying and keep crying and you can't get yourself together. If you get to a point like that, you definitely need to cut off the reading and end it at that time. But crying a little bit to connect with your client, with spirit, because you feel that authenticity between the message, I don't see anything wrong with that. My next question is, how do you deal with someone who when they find out you're a medium, say, can they have a reading right then and there in that moment? Okay, this has happened to me so many times. And I used to, in the beginning, I used to engage. And I used to try to give them a reading. And I'm gonna tell you and be totally honest with you, it sucked. Most of the readings were not very good because I felt like I had to prove myself. I felt like they were just staring at me. I felt intimidated but I didn't know at the time how to say no. My answer to this question is a hell no, okay? If somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you think you're a medium? Give me a reading right now. I charge for my services. You can go on my website, soulcareintuitive.com, okay? Um, and I say that with like love from my heart because there are people who truly do want and need a reading, but there are also people who are just doing it for you to prove to them that you can do it and they're not coming at it from a, a good space. They're coming at it from an ego. They're coming at it from anger because they don't believe or many different scenarios. So I say this with love in my heart, hell no. You as a person, you have boundaries and people should respect that, let alone respect you in general. It is not respectful to come up to somebody and say, oh, you think you're a medium or I've heard that you're a medium. I want a reading. Show me. Prove it to me right now. Who's with me right now? That is not okay. And you need to immediately set up a boundary and say, you know what? I respect that you want to hear from your loved ones. I don't perform right on the spot, but if you want to book an appointment with me, if you have a website, give them your website. If you're doing practice free reading, say we can make a time and a date later. I would be so happy to work with you. Doing something right on the spot because somebody is demanding that you prove to them that you're a medium is not helping you or them, and it's not helping their family member in spirit. I personally believe that when you're in an atmosphere of a reading, right, you're in this intentional space of connecting and reading and bringing your client and your person in spirit together, I personally believe there's a magic and a power in that. And spirit is going to communicate and flow with you so much easier than if you say, okay, well, Billy here wants a reading spirit come through right now. It To me, it doesn't feel authentic when you do that. And from experience, I have done that. And the readings, they don't feel right to me. The information doesn't come through clearly. My ego gets in the way because I just want to prove it to them. So for this question and this person, and I do receive this question a lot as well, set up that boundary. Those that respect you, those that really want to work with you, that really feel connected and drawn to you, they will respect that boundary 100%. And the ones that don't, you don't want to work with them anyway. Those are going to be the clients that nothing satisfies them. They want a refund. You, everything is wrong, even if everything was correct. And it's not worth your time. So setting a boundary right away is what's going to help you in those situations being strong enough in your self-confidence, in your self-esteem, in your business and in your space to say, look, I'm not doing this. I don't have to prove to you and I don't work on the spot. This next question is, what are your favorite ways of tracking and journaling about your mediumship journey and unfoldment? 
Now, you guys know if you have followed me from the very, very beginning that I love to journal everything. I have separate journals for so many things. I'm actually trying to condense myself into one, but I really love being able to look back at certain journals when I'm trying to find certain information. One of my journals is a mediumship journal. What I do is I write down every mediumship reading that I have done. I write down all of my experiences, what I saw, what I felt, what I heard. I write down whether the information was correct or incorrect. I write down what I felt when I saw those things, what I felt when I heard those things. I write down everything about my mediumship readings. And I do that because I want to be able to go back and see how far I've grown. I want to be able to go back and see where patterns are occurring so that, for example, if I keep seeing the same symbol, I'll know what it is because I'm going back through my journals. I have one which is an hourglass that my spirit guides have worked out with me where if I see an hourglass, I know that it's a person who passed away in spirit who knew they were going to pass away from a disease or a condition. Now that is personal to me. You might see a watch face. You might see a large clock. It could be anything for you, but for me, I only found that out through going back through my journals and realizing, wait, I saw this and it was correct. Okay, here it is again and it was correct. Here it is again and it was correct. So I knew at that moment that my spirit guides had helped me design this symbol so that I would know when spirit was communicating that information with me. So I love to journal everything in regards to my mediumship. So what I do is I have maybe a blank piece of paper or a separate notebook as I'm reading from my client. I like to scribble. Um, I'm Tyler Henry scribbles too, but it really does get your mind out of the way. I like to scribble and I'll write little bits and pieces of information down. And then after the reading, I'll take that piece of paper and the notes that I have made mentally and I'll write them down in my mediumship journal to keep them for later. And I have been doing this since the very, very beginning. And to see how far I have grown and how far I have come has been so wonderful for me in my journey. There's gonna be moments and times in your mediumship journey where you feel like everything's falling apart. You feel like you're turned off. You feel like things are not working. And you can grab this journal and see, oh my gosh, in the beginning I couldn't get anything and now I'm getting names. In the beginning, I couldn't get anything, and now I'm getting relationships. I'm feeling stuff, whereas I never felt before. It's going to be your lifeline and your life in your mediumship journey to have this journal to look back on. So the question is, what are your favorite ways of tracking and journaling? So I actually made my own journals on Amazon and I order them for myself and then send them here. You guys can order my journals as well. I have a link in the description for my Amazon books, but I made my own because I want to have the information in the same spot. I don't wanna to have to keep reading, okay, where was the name? Where was it? Okay, I want to just, okay, here's the names in this section here. This is relationship in this section. This is what I heard. This is what I saw. So I created my own to make it very aligned throughout the whole journal. Again, you can buy those on my Amazon shop. I have it linked below. But that's my favorite way to track is to keep them in a journal that has the information in a very organized way so that if I'm looking for something very specific, I know exactly where to look. I do suggest that as your form of journaling. But if you just have a plain notebook for now, that's completely fine. If you can organize it, or even if you don't care if it's organized, I'm like totally ridiculous with organization. So for me, it has to be organized or I just, I cannot concentrate. But even if you have a plain journal, writing everything down, even if you do a reading and you get one thing, let's say you're in a 10 minute reading and nothing is working, you're not feeling it, of course, write all that down. And then you get the initial M and it's right, write that down and circle it and put a check mark and a yes and oh my gosh, highlight it. Whatever you have to do to make yourself feel good because you have succeeded. Even if you get one thing right in a practice reading, you have succeeded. The journal is all about 
showing you how strong you are. That's why I love to keep a journal. You can look back to the beginning and three years now after I've been doing all of these readings, I'm still astonished to look back through these journals to see the different experiences I have gone through as I've grown and learned mediumship, even psychic work as well. So journaling is key in my opinion to mediumship and growing your mediumship. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I like to keep these videos short, so I will be making more. If you have any other questions that I didn't answer in this video, make sure you leave them in the comments below or you can send them to me on Facebook or Instagram Messenger and I will record them in the next video. I have a huge list going, so another one will be coming soon. Also, if you want to develop and learn how to become a medium, I do have my mediumship course, Soul Care Intuitive. It will walk walk you through all of the steps you need to learn how to become a medium and connect to those that have crossed over. I put my heart and soul into this course and I would be so honored if you would be my student. That is also in the description down below. Thank you so much, my lovely friend. I'll see you in the next video.